Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, so this uh, session is about human-level artificial intelligence, and we have a very distinguished panel to discuss, uh, to discuss these issues. So going from uh, right to left, we have Gary Marcus, uh, Tom Dietrich, Jan LeCun, Andrew Ng, and Shane Legg. Uh, and my name's Murray Shanahan, and I'm uh, gonna be moderating uh, the panel. Um, uh, now, we've solicited questions, because it's such a huge audience, uh, we, as you heard earlier on, we've solicited questions uh, online, but I gather that some people are having difficulty submitting them online, so they can also, if they want to, come to the front and submit questions to Victoria uh, Krakowna, who is right here, um, uh, if they would like to su submit questions during the, uh, during the panel. Um, okay, so... Um, okay, so I put a slide up here which uh, suggests some of the uh, topics that we could, I think we could, uh, we could discuss today. And, uh, and the first one that I wanted to, uh, to, to uh, tackle is the very notion of human-level artificial intelligence. And do we think that this concept of human-level artificial intelligence, and obviously here we're looking somewhat further ahead uh, in time than, uh, than we were looking in the previous panel in the previous session. So we're being a lot more speculative about where artificial intelligence might go in the more distant future, decades, in, in, in maybe a few decades. So is this concept of human-level artificial intelligence a useful one? Uh, do we want to try and make a more nuanced uh, version of it, maybe? Um, uh, do we instead maybe want to think about uh, the, this whole question of generality. Is that really what we're interested in here? Is it uh, how we build a more general kind of intelligence? And uh, many people these days use the term artificial general intelligence. So is that perhaps a more useful uh, concept? So I'm hoping the panel aren't going to uh, undermine the c notion of human level of artificial intelligence altogether, because in that case, uh, we haven't got a lot to discuss. Um, but I'll start off by, uh, by uh, asking uh, whether they think this is a useful uh, idea. So maybe I'll start with Gary. Um, and I need it badly because I'm sick. Okay, great. Um, so just on the question of whether AGI itself is a meaningful concept, I would say obviously not. Obviously it's a crude approximation, but that doesn't mean we need to go home. So um, I think it obviously should remind everybody of the famous saying about pornography, I know it when I see it. Um, it's probably gonna be hard to define, there probably aren't sharp boundaries for it, and it probably entails a lot of things. There are probably a lot of domains in which we are already exceeded human level AI, right? So the planning that we do in a chess computer already exceeds human level AI. But I think there are a lot of things we haven't made much progress on yet. So a good example of that would be com comprehending open text. We just don't have machines that are anywhere near as good as, say, a 12-year-old at reading an arbitrary story and being able to say who did what to whom. And so I think even if we can't strictly define AGI, it's clear that there are challenges in front of us, and they're going to revolutionize the world when we get there, and so it's certainly worth talking about. Okay. Uh, does, who wants to pick up on that? Uh, Jan? Sure. Uh, so first of all, I don't need to re remind this audience that we are still very far from anything that could be qualified as human-level uh, AI, uh, but perhaps for people who watch the video later who are not uh, as, as clued into the techniques that we're using about this, we're very far away from it. Um, um, it's only mildly useful, as Gary said, there are certain areas, you can, you can go down to the toy store or supermarket down the streets and buy a, a gadget for 30 bucks that will beat you at chess. Uh, in some respect, that machine is super, uh, you know, is as human level intelligence or, or better, um, and and we're going to see more and more of machines of this type that are expert in particular areas. We have lots of them, uh, including in things like image recognition nowadays, which we didn't think were were attainable uh, in a short time uh, just five years ago. Uh, so we're going to see more and more of those things coming up. And the question is, um, um, uh, in the end, will we have uh, a collection of all those all, all of those things that together uh, uh, cover all of what we call uh, human intelligence. Um, I think that's kind of qualitatively different a little bit than, than solving individual problems. So, so do you think that the uh, essence of what's qualitatively different there is, is captured by this notion of generality? So 
Is it, and is there something uh, you know, sort of deep and important that is difficult to capture there? Before I learned anything about DeepMind, I wrote a piece for The New Yorker called Can Super Mario Beat AI? And it was about a kind of satirical project where somebody built, I think it was an old Nintendo thing where they had access to the entire data set, um, all, all the pixels in, in the image, but all the memory registers, and were able to beat a whole bunch of different games just by sheer brute force. And my piece was kind of satirical as well as, as this piece that I was writing about. But the idea is, yeah, you need to do um, generality. DeepMind is taking a step towards that. One could argue about whether it's a step far enough, but generality is certainly part of what's been missing from AI. So as the, uh, the, the person who uh, proposed the term artificial general intelligence, I guess I should uh, try to de uh, defend it a little bit. Um, so I think it is a useful notion. I think it's useful uh, to distinguish between uh, systems which can specialize in all sorts of different things such as these chess playing algorithms versus systems which are not really designed for anything in particular but they have a range of capacities which allow them to span uh, an extended space of, of problems. So I think that was a that's useful terminology to sort of help clarify the, the importance of that and I think this is um, if you, if you read some of my thesis and so on, this is a fairly common perspective on the notion of what intelligence is, that the, the emphasis on generality and the fact that humans can you know, learn to play chess and go and poker and space invaders and speak Japanese and, 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 and do algebra and so on and so on. This huge range of things that people can do and how this is very, very different to what we typically see in, um, in artificial systems. Um, in terms of the the importance of human level artificial intelligence. Um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's true that, you know, obviously uh, computers will be far superior, already are far superior to humans in many things and, 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 and vastly inferior. But I think it's also a, an interesting um, and, and natural point of reference when uh, computers reach a level of capability where over all the sorts of mental tasks that, that people can do, um, they are by and large as good if not better. Because this is, you know, because this is a level of intelligence and generality that's sort of very, very natural to, for us to think in terms of. So I don't know, you know, in, the, in a, a theoretical sense, I don't know if there's anything particularly special about that, but I think it is a very interesting point for us to think about in terms of the evolution of, um, you know, and, and the development of, the, of, of systems and, and their capability and so on. So for that reason, I think it's a, it's a, it's a useful one to, to, to have in mind. Yeah, so I guess I sort of see two different reasons or maybe two different things we might be talking about when we talk about uh, uh, artificial general intelligence. On the one hand, uh, you know, one of the big motivations for the entire field of artificial intelligence was to understand what is intelligence. And, uh, and, and as people are sort of our, our best uh, in example of it, until recently perhaps, um, uh, understanding just basic science, how is it that people manage to you know, flexibly move across scales of time and space in their reasoning? How do they rapidly learn the N plus first task after having learned N previous tasks? Um, how, how do they allocate their time and their resources very well? So all these notions of, of uh, you know, uh, bounded rationality and so on. Uh, and and our, uh, our understanding of that is, you know, we've been making progress over time, but, but it, it's been slow, I would say. Um, and, but, so that's one reason. The other reason is, uh, you know, would it be useful economically, you know, for business or for medicine or whatever, for something society cared about? Um, there, I don't know, the story is quite so obvious, right? Because um, uh, right now we found very high value in these narrow systems that, that, uh, that uh, and, and those systems, it seems, are easier to build and easier to understand, easier to field, and, and more or less easier to maintain. Um, and it's not, it, the, I would say we don't have any really convincing demonstration that a, a general purpose system would have a, a better value proposition. Yeah, so I, uh, I think we should let Shane come back on that one, and then maybe Andrew's got something. Yeah, so I, I disagree with that, and I think that we're seeing um, evidence of the importance of increasing levels of generality and learning sweeping through um, many areas of artificial intelligence and machine learning at the moment. So 
the way in which um, handcrafted speech recognition systems have been superseded by learning systems now, the way in which handcrafted image recognition systems have been superseded by learning systems, and I would say the way in which handcrafted continuous control uh, algorithms are starting to be challenged by learning systems, and I expect that they will go beyond as well. I don't think you will ever get anything as sophisticated as human level motor control over such a vast range of different situations unless you have algorithms that are really learning rather than trying to build all sorts of very clever things into them. Just, well, Andrew, you. Yeah, I want to make an analogy. Um, so first, those of you that know me, I, I love AI machine learning. I think it's having a vast impact, helping a lot of people. I'm super excited about AI. But I think that working on artificial general intelligence today, work on AGI today, is a little bit like working on colonizing Alpha Centauri. Right? It's a great mission. I really hope that humanity will get there someday uh, to colonize other star systems. Alpha Centauri is four light years away with a lot of problems to solve. Um, I picture that there's probably a meeting somewhere of the Society for Colonizing Alpha Centauri. I'm picturing you know, mainly a bunch of like, bearded guys and maybe you know, men and women debating, oh, if you want to colonize Alpha Centauri, you've got to solve um, hydroponics or some DNA thing or whatever. Just like I think in AI where people are getting to say, oh, if you want to solve AGI, you've got to have causal reason, you've got to have analogical reason, you've got to have this and this and this and this. And you can make up little stories like that. All this can make for great research. I definitely support these things. But um, I think it is so far away, uh, we should work on it. And when we work on it, I'm sure we'll get lucky. And some of the things we do will be useful and have short-term impact. Um, I will give you one data point. I, so I live in Silicon Valley. I have for a long time. I live and breathe and eat next to a lot of people uh, in Silicon Valley and in Beijing that are the ones on the front lines of AI, building code, shipping product, you know, really making a difference to hundreds of millions of people's lives today. Almost all the people I know that are doing that important work, transforming people's lives today, almost none of us use the word AGI in our vocabulary. We just don't think about it um, in the same way that I have the greatest admiration for the people building space rockets, trying to send satellites to low Earth or orbits or whatever. I suspect that most of them do not spend their day to day talking about how to colonize Alpha Centauri. Okay, that's great. So, uh, so I think we've moved uh, very nicely into the question of when uh, Thank you know, you. If and when this, uh, you know, this is gonna, this is gonna happen. So I'm sure that some members of the panel have got something to, to, to say about that. Maybe Gary, and then, well, maybe everybody. I Certainly th Shane, I'm sure. Probably we all do. But I'll just start with something that Andrew just said, um, which I think very much bears on when we get there, which is what strategy we take. So I think there's a lot of low-hanging commercial fruit that makes sense for people to pursue right now, but doesn't necessarily take us closer to AGI. And so, um, to the extent that we think getting to AGI faster is a good idea, which we can itself argue over, um, we might want to think about different strategies. So most of the research is being driven by short-term commercial interest, and I think that leads to solutions that are good statistical approximations of things where there are underlying causal models, for example, and not necessarily to us capturing, for example, the causal models. Um, and so if you can get like 80% of a problem done very quickly and faster than your competitor, that might make more sense than building the AI, AGI system that might take a lot longer to um, pay its rewards. I agree, it will take longer. Um, and it's usually easier to, in a particular domain to you know, craft something more for that domain. So I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that. Um, but if there are fewer efforts that are looking at building really, really general intelligence, well, maybe we have less competition. Um, well, I, no, I don't want to answer the timing question, but what are the obstacles to uh, more intelligent machines? Whether we call it AGI or human level intelligence. I think it's pretty clear to me, it wasn't clear to me um, only five years ago, uh, what was the path to, to definitely making machines more intelligent. But we're starting to, you know, it was kind of like driving in a fog. We, we didn't know where the obstacles were and we didn't know what, we're go what we brick wall we're going to encounter. I think now we see a mountain somewhere on the horizon that we need to, um, to get through. And that, and that mountain, there's two mountains really, or two peaks that we have to go through. One is um, uh, the, the sort of melding of uh, representation learning or deep learning as, as is practiced today with uh, reasoning and memory. In fact, there is an entire workshop on this topic uh, um, Saturday um, by a bunch of people from Facebook, not surprisingly. Um, 
And there is another area which I think is, is probably even more important, and it's unsupervised learning. So most of the learning that animals and humans uh, do is unsupervised learning. And it's a, um, you know, rather than say supervised learning or reinforcement learning. So I have this, uh, this joke that I say when I'm surrounded by friends from DeepMind, which is um, if intelligence is a cake, um, the cake itself is unsupervised learning, the icing on the cake is supervised learning, and the cherry on the cake is reinforcement learning. Um, and you know, DeepMind being so interested in reinforcement learning, uh, you know, that kind of starts an interesting discussion. Um, <laughs> but I think really what, so here is the problem. We know how to do supervised learning quite well, and the demonstrations of the last few years of, of deep learning and commercial nets and things like this are really, really impressive, uh, more impressive than I thought they would be. Like if you had asked me five years ago, do you think you should use a commercial net to do face recognition? I would have told you no. You know, they're good for like generic categories, but for faces, no. You, you know, you, use a more specific method for this. They actually work really well. Um, and there's a lot of you know, other uh, domains that we've seen like this where, where those things work amazingly well, much better than we thought. Uh, so we know how to do supervised learning. We have a good handle on some areas of reinforcement learning. Of course, there's a lot of interesting work going on there that we need to do. The problem is that we have no idea how to do unsupervised learning properly. There are situations where unsupervised learning works, like for example, uh, learning language models, uh, predicting the next word in a, in, a, in a text, it works okay, okay? We can learn representation of a text like this, it's relatively simple. But if I ask you to build a system that will uh, watch a movie, or look at a video, and predict what the next frame in the movie is gonna be, or what the a frame, uh, you know, a number of different choices for what a frame a second from now is gonna be, or a minute from now, an hour from now, um, we have no technique that can do this properly. Um, and and it, it means that there is a, an essential underlying principle that we haven't figured out, and this is the principle that machines and animals do to learn. So why is it that unsupervised learning is so critical? It is that, um, uh, and it's an argument that Jeff Hinton has been making for, for many years, uh, decades, uh, is the fact that if, if you have a learning system with you know, a few billion parameters, a few billion synapses, let's say, if it's a brain, or a few million parameters if it's an artificial neural net. The only way you can, you can have enough information, you can give enough information to the system to constrain that many weights is by asking it to discover the structure of the world. You're not gonna get enough information out of a, a piece of reinforcement once in a while or, you know, a bunch of labels um, um, uh, by, by showing pictures, right? So the, the, the problem we're facing now is that we don't know how to exploit, how to have machines discover the structure of the world by just observ observing it. And that's the problem we have to solve. That's a big mountain we have to, to solve. The smaller mountain is the reasoning memory, ex um, et cetera. I agree to everything except the size. Um, so I agree with everything there, except I think maybe I'd like to correct a, a misperception that we mostly do reinforcement learning at DeepMind. That's not true at all. Um, we're most famous for doing reinforcement learning and Atari playing and all that sort of thing, because that's what you see in the media a lot. But if you actually look through our publications, we, uh, we do a lot of uh, generative models and unsupervised learning, and it's actually one of the biggest topics that we do. And you'll see a lot more papers in the coming year, including things like um, predicting what's coming next in video frames and so on that, that Jan was talking about. I think, I, uh, I think we, we, we want run, run the risk right now in our field uh, that because we've had this huge success in deep learning over the last five years, that we see the whole world from the perspective of that. But I think we have to remember that if we look in the AI literature, uh, a lot of the people in the literature are, are, are living w where we are in the one, one over squared n world, right? Where as, we, as, our, as our data sets get bigger and bigger, we rapidly improve our performance. There's a whole bunch of other people who live in the B to the D world, the branching factor raised to the depth of the search tree. For them, uh, it, uh, even uh, you know, an order of magnitude speed up is just one level shallower in the, or one level deeper in the search tree. Um, and so there's a, uh, the problems that they face there I think are quite different from the ones that we face in our one over root n domain, uh, you know, regime. And, uh, and, and they've been making progress too, but it, I think uh, we need to be humble about how far one over root n is gonna carry us. And we are going to need a lot of, of additional ideas beyond what we have right now. So, yeah, and do you want to come back on that as well? Ian? Yeah, I got a uh, direct answer to this. So, the, the interesting thing that's happened over the last uh, few months or year, at least, is, is the fact that uh, one of those problems, which is, is classically been, uh, you know, R to the D, D to the N, D to the B, whatever, the, the tree exploration. Uh, um, 
uh, is now, are now being solved with uh, supervised machine learning. So a good example is the game of Go. Uh, both people at DeepMind and at Facebook have been working on this, and there are systems now that are basically convolutional nets trained uh, to look at the Go board and predict where the next best move is going to be. And you combine this with search techniques, and you get pretty good uh, Go players. And so those things kind of reduce the amount of search you have to do by essentially you know, using uh, supervised learning or imitation learning in that case. Okay, so actually that brings us uh, to, to, the, to the question of what are the, possibly the... Actually, before we get on to that, I want, I'd like to ask uh, you, Jan, what, coming back on what you said in response to what Andrew said, whether using Andrew's analogy that, that you're perhaps a bit less skeptical than Andrew about the prospect of human-level AI, and you see, see us, to, to use his metaphor, that we're more you know, in the position that they were at the beginning of the Apollo program, that it maybe is an engineering... Uh, task that it's maybe a decade's worth or something or, or a couple of decades but you do actually see it as it's not Alpha Centauri right it's the moon it's, it's, it's not Alpha Centauri it's not the moon is you know I think I think we could build considerably more intelligent machines uh, without having to break any major law of physics that we know about whereas colonizing uh, Alpha Centauri that might actually require a major revision of what we know about physics um, yeah, you know unless you let people you know, reproduce in space and travel for 40,000 years, but, um, or robots. So, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm less pessimistic than, uh, than Andrew on this one. I think, I think there are clear obstacles that we might, that might take a few years to clear, uh, or might take a few decades to clear, and frankly, I don't know, and there's probably other obstacles behind that we haven't realized. There's a, it's a very long history in AI of, uh, you know, people having a set of techniques and thinking, now is you know I just have to drive on this highway. Okay, there is fog, but I'm I'm quite sure there is no wall. And then you you hit a wall after five years, and there is kind of a AI winter again. So um, you know, we don't know what what's the next obstacle we're going to uh, to to encounter once we clear unsupervised running reasoning memory, etc. Um, um, but but I I'm, I'm you know I I think um, uh, I, I wouldn't be as um, as pessimistic as how long it's going to take for for really sort of. You know, making significant progress. I don't want to talk about human level intelligence because I don't know what that means really, but, uh, but make significant progress at least. You know, to, to, to be clear, I'm very optimistic about short term progress, even progress in the next five years or something. But there's a big gap between that. Um, I hope we'll colonize Mars or something, but there is a big gap between progress in the next several years, which I'm very optimistic about, versus the more distant future, which I think is harder to be certain about. Um, I'm, I'm curious about something. How many of you in this room are students, you know, grad students or undergrads? Okay, cool, a lot of you. I want to share with you something um, about strategy. Uh, and this relates to, to, to how we might make progress or not make progress towards AI. When I was a student myself, um, I had not yet learned the skill of seeing a little bit further into the future. And so I could see maybe one year ahead or maybe half a year ahead. And when people talked about seeing beyond that, you know, frankly, I thought it was bullshit because I just didn't see it. But as I've gotten older, one of the things I've struggled to learn is how to see further into the future. Uh, so as to better take actions today that allow us to have the best impact on the world, not just six months from now, but maybe one or two or three or maybe five years from now. So um, there was a book written by uh, Philip Tedlock called Super Forecasting. It's one of the studies that's really influenced me. That, that really studied how far can humans see into the future. And what he showed was that looking at the broad swath of the population, as well as you know, CIA analysts with access to the latest top secret data, blah, 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 no one, not even the best you know, intelligence analysts, could see more than five years in the future. Uh, this study was done for geopolitical events. So questions like, you know, what's the chance that the number of refugees in Syria will be more than X million in six months? And, and questions like that. What's the chance that this country attacked that country? No one could see more than, basically more than about five years in the future. I don't know if this conclusion applies to technology. When I look back in history, I feel like none of us could see more than 10 years ahead in technology. I mean, none of us could forecast the rise of deep learning 10 years ago. None of us had the iPhone or the cell phone, the, the, the smartphone is less than 10 years old. None of us saw that coming, you know, and, and I don't know if any of us can see more than five years or 10 years. But I think there is a big difference in uh, skill between people that can only see one year ahead versus people that can see three or four, maybe five years ahead because you can do a much better job relating your actions today to uh, uh, how to have an impact on maybe the three to five, maybe 10, but that's a real, real, real switch time scale. 
Um, so my opinion is that um, there's a lot of progress in AI in the one to three year time scale where I think I can see quite clearly. And I actually agree with Jan. I think unsupervised learning is one of the um, next great ways. I think the recent rise of machine learning has mostly been supervised learning, deep learning, supervised learning. I think that as we run out of label data for a lot of times, it's getting so hard to get more label data. Um, I think that unsupervised learning could be the next big wave. Um, Having said that, I think that there is a big gap between those of us that try really hard to peer several years ahead versus those that think they can see 20 years ahead. And frankly, people that think they can see 20 years ahead, I call bullshit. I don't think any of us can see 20 years ahead in, 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 in the space of technology. Um, and you know, as Jan said, we've had multiple AI winters. Uh, we tend to be like that. I was a student in Carnegie Mellon uh, many years ago, and I still remember, was it the 80s or early 90s when Alvin Right, CMU's uh, self-driving car trained using neural networks was driving a few roads on Pittsburgh, and there were the breathless media reports about how you know neural networks for self-driving cars was in the early 90s, late 80s, and early 90s, how self-driving cars based on the work of CMU was going to take over the world, and none of them, none of us at that time could see far enough ahead. Um, I think we are actually reaching a point to take that as an example where we can see a clear path from where we are today to realistic self-driving cars. Uh, and, and I don't like to talk about things and hype about things where we can't you know, kind of see, uh, have, have an opinion about what the future might look like. Um, I do a lot of work on self-driving cars at Baidu. Right? And, and the reason we talk about it is because I think we see a path to actually make it happen. Um, and and, and I, I think it's more responsible as scientists to um, speak carefully. And I do support working toward colonizing Alpha Centauri, just to be clear, right? I think that's a great thing to work on. Um, I don't think everyone should work on it, and I think we're very careful of, of how we, of, of the claims we make when, when, we're, when we're working on that problem. Yeah, so a specific answer so on the self-driving car. When I saw the uh, Alvin paper, um, uh, I told myself, this guy should use a convolutional net, not, uh, not a fully connected network. That's obvious, and you know, and then we could build chips. In fact, you know, I was at Bell Labs at the time, and and we were building chips for convolutional nets. And it was pretty clear that if you wanted to build self-driving cars, you know, with the progress of technology, you would have to have a system of this type that we you put, you know, behind a single camera, maybe two cameras, and and that that was the way the way to go. So this was the early 90s. Um, I thought, uh, you know, if uh, Bell Labs had continued on this path, perhaps uh, we would have had this kind of technology much earlier. Um, but it didn't happen this way. First of all, neural net fell out of favor. Uh, uh, second of all, Bell Labs kind of, uh, you know, break, broke itself into two, and so uh, this kind of stuff uh, wasn't possible at AT&T anymore. Um, and uh, we're working on other things. Uh, but it was pretty clear to me that you know the, the self-driving cars of the future is were, were going to be um, using convnets, and in fact they do. If you buy a Tesla today, it has a little vision system um, that keeps you in lane, and it actually is a convolutional net that looks at, at, the, at, the, at the road. Um, you know, I had a paper about uh, 12 years ago that exactly used that and demonstrated a little robot driving around. So you could see this. You know, it took longer than I thought it would take. All right. The self-driving cars are actually interesting in terms of like the gap between being 80% of the way there and being 100% of the way there. So um, it's very interesting in particular because if it works 97% of the time, then the driver's gonna fall asleep and maybe not be there for the other 3% of the time. So I think the Tesla stuff, if I understand it, depends pretty heavily on the lane markings. If they disappear, then the, the driving system doesn't work very well. I've heard other systems have trouble in fog and I assume where you and I live in, in New York City with a lot of pedestrians, there's gonna be some issues uh, and so forth. And so there's a question about even there, though I don't think it's at all the poster child for AGI, but even there, there's a question about to get that last couple percent to make it truly reliable and safe, do you need like richer real world models or is the convolutional net stuff um, going to be enough? I don't think anybody knows the answer there. Actually, no, I, I, you know, since, since someone started the subject class, let me describe to you how I think we will get there. And I think this is a realistic plan. You know, so far, a lot of the debate has been about whether you uh, try to do everything at the same time. Let's build a car that does everything on all roads, all circumstances, blah, blah, blah. that's really hard. Versus um, the car makers is taking an incremental approach where you make the cars more and more autonomous. Um, I think that's a different approach that we should consider, which is to build a self fully autonomous, uh, fully autonomous car that does everything, but only on one route, right? So if you want to build a bus, we'll have a bus just drive in the same circle over and over and over again. We have monorails and, and at no, the no, airport no, no, already. And I think that if you do that, 
then um, you can work with uh, local uh, 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 government, local police, and make sure that there's no construction there that surprises you. And you can fit your models just to, you know, obstacle detection on this one road. That's all you need to do and make that safe. And if you can do that, I think that in the relatively near future, not driving everywhere in the city, but just on one route in the city, we can put cars in the road in a relatively short term, small, very small numbers of years. After you've built this one road driving round and round the circles, you add a second road, round and round the circles, add a third road, until slowly you can build this up to take over or have your car able to take over more and more roads until hopefully you can then evolve toward being able to drive everywhere. Um, I think that so far, there, there, everyone's been assuming that the dimension, I think most progress is incremental. A lot of progress is incremental, right? A lot of progress seems like it came out of nowhere, but to those of us on the inside working, it, it was actually more incremental than it looks like from the outside. Um, a lot of car makers think that the dimension of incrementation is to build a car that drives everywhere and to make a car that drives everywhere more and more autonomous. There's another dimension that very few groups have considered that I think is actually a more promising strategy. This is what we're doing at Baidu, uh, which is um, uh, to drive a car that is fully autonomous, but the dimension of incrementation is to drive on more and more and more roads over time. So I actually find that a promising approach. And, Isn't and to, Google doing that in Palo Alto? Oh, I think uh, maybe, I, mean, I yeah, I, I actually honestly don't know. I, Google, I, yeah, I honestly don't, honestly don't know. I don't know what Google is doing. They, does someone know? Do you want to say? Luckily, Shane, Shane is here to speak. Uh, I don't work on self-driving cars, so I'm not going to try and comment on that. Um, with respect to having um, AGI as a goal, it's, um, you know, it, it's, I don't want to claim that we know when we'll do it. Um, you know, maybe there are five breakthroughs, maybe there are 50 breakthroughs. Nobody, nobody really knows and, until we get there. Um, you know, it's, and it's going to take a long time. It's going to take decades or something. No, nobody really knows. Um, so it's not about knowing when exactly various things will, will happen and be able to forecast that very accurately, but I think it's, it's, it's useful in the sense that it allows you to conceive of a problem and start thinking about all the different aspects of that problem. It gives you a framework for thinking about things and the types of uh, solutions and the different, part, different things you need to solve on the road to get to, to where you want to get to. Whereas if you are trying to optimize something much more locally, you might find that you can get better, better solutions and, and, and so on and beat the current state of the art. But it may also be clear that in the long run, this isn't, isn't what you need to do to get to, for example, AGI. So I, I think it's useful in terms of creating a framework for you to think about your priorities and the problems that you need to work on rather than a claim about being able to predict exactly when we'll get there or when we'll solve any of these particular problems. Uh, I, I would like to um, uh, sort of, uh, speaking of this sort of notion of, 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 the, of getting to uh, AGI or human level AI, I just don't think it's an event. So we see sometimes in the press things like achieving human level AI will be the greatest event in human history. Okay, I don't think it's an event. It's a very slow evolution, and it was kind of just what Gary was saying also. Uh, it's, it, we will add capabilities, and, and uh, I think there's a there's good argument uh, from Stuart Russell uh, that, that the, the hardware matters in the sense that human uh, you know, constraints and biology lead to certain sets of resource effectiveness trade-offs. And, and a lot of our meta-reasoning is precisely about uh, al resource allocation to achieve, to optimize that trade-off, and evolution has worked on that too. When we build artificial intelligence on various different kinds of hardware, they will, each of those different hardware infrastructures will probably lead to different trade-offs. And so we probably won't see, uh, you know, the so systems that have exactly the same strengths and weaknesses as humans. They'll have different strengths and weaknesses. So there won't be a moment, an instant, an event. It's it's more. We'll just see gradually improving technology, and and just like Moore's law is the sum of 12 or 13 major advances along the way and technical tricks, uh, the same is true for for the kinds of things that that will lead us eventually to to something that we would say was a very general, um, reusable, redeployable kind of AI, which is the time technology we'd like to see. I I mostly agree with you. I don't think there'll be a single moment, but. When people write the history, maybe 50 or 100 or 200 years from now, I think one thing that they'll pay attention to will be when computers were able to read open and read or listen to open-ended domain general text. I think that may itself 
be something that takes five years or something like that, but I think that will be one of the turning points. I don't think many people think that it's going to be some sort of sudden event or well-defined point in time, but nevertheless, I think it's, there, is something, there is something fundamentally, um, something fundamental has really happened when, the, when machines are, are smart enough to rival us over most cognitive capacities, and you, know, you can sit down and have a really sophisticated philosophical debate about something with a machine. Um, and it's, I guess it's, it, oh, that's, that's fine. <laughs> that would happen after the moment I was pointing out. Actually, I'd like to just come back and ask uh, Andrew something. So, so you, um, you, know, you uh, talked about you know, responsible science and so on, and, and you grant that we can't see into the future, right? So surely that means to say that we can't be very confident you know, that we won't achieve human-level artificial intelligence perhaps in 20 years, right? You say we, we, we can't see into 20 years ahead. We certainly can't see 50 years ahead. So, so doesn't that mean that uh, to say that scientific responsibility should mean that we should at least think about the possibility, even if we don't know, the possibility that we might create human-level AI and what that might mean uh, for humanity? Um. You know, I think there, there, was a, there was someone I once said that's been quoted to bunch in the media when, I think this is when, you know, there's been a, a, a lot of hype about AI recently, about uh, um, uh, evil AI, evil super intelligence, evil killer robots. Uh, uh, I think, Dennis, when you guys started, got acquired by Google, you, a condition on that was uh, setting up a committee to ensure ethical AI. And I think the peak of the hype was when Elon Musk said that uh, uh, AI is more dangerous than uh, uh, nuclear weapons, something like that, right? I, I hope that was the peak anyway, who knows? Um, and one thing I, I, I said in the code a lot is that I think, you know, worrying about AI evil killer robots is like um, worrying about overpopulation on the planet Mars, right? I, I, I hope that, you know, we will get to a point someday where we colonize the planet Mars and it will be overpopulated at some point and it will be, Polluted because you know, and 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 there'll be all these children on Mars, sadly, dying of pollution. And we need to worry about it then. But I just don't know how to work on that problem now productively because we haven't even set foot on the planet yet. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to you know form a committee as as I guess Demis did to, to ensure ethical AI. I I think it's great if people want to form committees to study this at great length. Um, I. Personally, I'm choosing not to spend my time on those committees, uh, but I have no objection, really. I think it's a fine thing. You know, as a society, we need to work on different things, right? It really, many different people need to work on many different things. And it's good if I work on something, Jan works on something, Tom works on something else, Gary works on something else, Shane works on something else. Um, I think the best work I can do for humanity right now is building and shipping deep learning algorithms, working on self-driving cars, working on speech recognition, working on computer vision. That's what excites me more. But I'm actually glad that there are other parts of society, you know, studying ethical AI. I think it is, I think it's a great thing to do. Um, so with regard to the committee, I think it's a little bit overblown. Um, you know, we have a number of people who get together and occasionally and talk about um, questions about AI safety and responsibility and so on. Um, I think that's a, a good discussion to have from time to time. Um, of course, the media likes to blow that into some sort of horror story that we're all freaking out and, and very, very worried, and so we must be meeting to talk about these topics. No, I think it's just a responsible discussion to have um, from, from time to time. Um, in terms of um, AI safety and all that, I think it's both overblown and underemphasized in some ways. So the, a lot of the, the media discussion um, gives you the impression that, you know, these super powerful AIs are turning up any day now and they're, they're, they're a huge threat and we should be re very afraid of it and all this sort of thing. Um, I don't think that's the case at all. It's, it's, you know, it's gonna, we're going to be working on AI for a long time and there's lots and lots of problems we have to solve and there are a lot of uncertainties around it and so on and so on. That said, um, many people believe, and there are surveys that show this, people who are working in AI and machine learning, that um, advanced artificial intelligence I won't use the term human level, but at least fairly advanced artificial intelligence will be, is a realistic pros uh, possibility within, you know, the lifetimes of some of the people um, here today. And if, if that is the case, then I think, you know, it, uh, it, many people would also agree that if this were to happen, the uh, impact on our society in all sorts of ways, they could be negative, they could be 
they could be very positive, um, would be profound. And so if we are um, you know, approaching, even if it's um, you know, decades and decades away, if we are approaching a transition of this magnitude, I think it's only responsible that we start to consider um, to whatever extent we can in advance, the technical aspects of this, societal aspects of this, legal aspects of this, and, and whatever else. Because, you know, it's um, being, being prepared ahead of time is uh, always, always uh, better than trying to be prepared after, after you, you really need some good answers. So, Gary. Uh, and, then, and then, yeah. <coughs> I agree with what Shane said, and I, I like the formulation of the argument that you made, Murray. The one thing that I would add is, in terms of being prepared, we don't just need to prepare for AGI. We just need to prepare for better AI that's going to have lots of implications. So there's this kind of notion of a magical moment, which I think none of us on the stage actually believe in. And, and in the public eye, it's all about what happens at that magical moment. But you can think just Internet of Things and a whole lot more deep learning on the ground doing a whole lot more things. Um, and already, I think, issues of safety and security and, and risk already become important. So I think it's important to study these issues regardless of you know, whether the progress is linear or exponential or whatever towards this mythical AGI thing. There, there is progress. It's substantial. It is going to change things, and I think it makes sense to study them. I, yeah, I yeah. So I think some of the fears are um, of, of you know, human-level AI are related to the fact that people think um, uh, artificial intelligent machines will have similar intelligence to humans. So that relates to one of the questions that's on the board right now. Um, you know, will uh, uh, AI look like, like human intelligence? And I, I think not, not at all. We, we like to think of ourselves, we like to think of our mind as being sort of general intelligent machines, but our brains are very, very, very far from being general. We're, we're driven by, um, you know, basic instincts that are built that were built into us by evolution for survival. Uh, or our brains are very limited in their you know type of connection and, and signals they can process and the kind of functions they can compute uh, efficiently. And we, you know, we 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 are very slow at adding numbers together, much slower than computers are. So there are certain things that um, uh, you know it's very difficult for us to imagine a different type of intelligence than human intelligence because that's the only example we have in front of us. But in fact, machines will have very, very different types of intelligence. So in particular, they will not have all the drives that make humans do bad things to each other. Um, um, you know, we, we generally do bad things to each other when we feel uh, threatened and we want access to uh, resources, we want to, um, you know, not starve and, you know, et cetera. Uh, you know, preservation instinct basically makes us uh, uh, do bad things to each other. There's no reason to build this into machines. Um, and so there's no reason for machines to have curiosity um, unless we build that explicitly into them. And, and so, you know, uh, so, so a lot of dangers that we imagine of machines, you know, uh, like in, in movies that you see, uh, um, you know, coming out of Hollywood where, you know, uh, a machine all of a sudden becomes intelligent and all of a sudden figures out that, you know, there, there's a world out there and becomes curious to see it. There's no reason for machines to be curious unless we build that, uh, that, that property into them. Uh, I'd just like to point out that X Machina didn't come out of Hollywood but out of... England. <laughs> you know, so I, I actually agree with Gary that uh, the, the rise of AI and, and, and yonder, the rise of AI poses challenges. I think it's less of uh, uh, the risk of AI turning unethical, kind of as Jan says, I think, maybe. Um, I think that the biggest challenge is the challenge to um, employment. So I see Eric Brynolfsson here. Eric and Andrew McAfee have been uh, uh, really thought leaders. They have, their, their work has been influenced my thinking a lot. Read that book if you haven't, uh, of the impact of, uh, of intelligence, of IT, AI. Uh, and IT more broadly on employment. I think that's actually the biggest challenge we will face in the next several years. Um, and I sometimes worry about the hype, about you know AI evil intelligences uh, being a distraction from the much more serious challenge we face, which is that uh, uh, of, of, of the, pot the potential for massive unemployment or massive downward pressure on wages. And I would much rather have um, serious leaders in government and corporations and academia have a serious conversation about that challenge, which I think will affect hundreds of millions of people, uh, uh, even more so than having them worry about, you know, AI turning evil. And that's all, all true. That's all true even without AGI. So, I mean, presuming that my kind of gambit about AGI and automatic cars is wrong, um, automatic cars won't require at least much in the way of AGI. Maybe they require a little bit, but they're already going to significantly um, change the, the labor landscape. And they, we're going to see a lot of that <coughs> possibly long before AGI happens.
Tom, Tom, do you want to say anything? You've been quiet for a little bit. <laughs> Uh, no, I'll, no, I'll defer. Okay. Well, maybe we, if so, if this is a little pause, maybe we could move on to some of the questions. Or do, do, do you have them to say, John? Uh, some of the questions that uh, that we've received from uh, from the um, from the audience um, by email. So, thank you very much for the questions that have been sent in on our, our little uh, online form. Uh, uh, so, so quite a few of them have been sort of covered already. So, I'm just picking out a couple. Um, uh, that definitely have and the actually the first one that I would like to pick out relates to another of the uh, questions on the board which I'd like to maybe rephrase a little bit which is I mean let's put aside the whole business about AGI and human level AI but let's suppose that you wanted to kind of go for the moonshot as it were towards and make a you know make a kind of big leap towards the next level of of sophistication of AI, right? Then what would be the kinds of technologies that you would go for? What would, be, what would you see as the major research themes uh, to go for? And, and so maybe you could um, all kind of uh, uh, address that one. But in, there's a particular question here, which is that, so one person asked, uh, is reinforcement learning an acceptable model for general uh, AI? And if not, why not? And I see Rich Sutton in the audience right in the front here. So he, maybe, maybe he wants to uh, uh, chip in there, I don't know. We could give you the mic, actually. Mike, Rich. Hey. Well, of course it is. <laughs> yeah. I want to say one thing further about that, which is that uh, unsupervised learning is un There's actually a terminolo terminological issue about whether unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. I mean, all these things, all these things are, um, are these terms, they evolve over, over years as people do different things and people, people who were doing one thing do another thing and they include it in what, the name of what they're doing. Uh, these, all these things evolve over, over time. In particular, unsupervised learning has really evolved over time and probably will evolve quite a bit further. And uh, I'm betting that in the long run, we do unsupervised learning, we'll do a lot of things in prediction, and we'll be using a lot of the same prediction learning methods that we use in reinforcement learning. So I think there's a lot of room to grow there. Just wanted to. Thank you. I, I've always wanted to jump off uh, the stage into an audience, and now I've full, <laughs> <coughs> fulfilled a kind of lifetime dream there. Um, so maybe I'll hand over to, the, uh, to, to uh, Andrew. You look dying to say something. So do you, Jan. So. So, you know, uh, uh, in terms of um, what areas of AI, uh, what areas of research to invest in, um, I think, um, you know, uh, deep learning is really rising now. One thing that many of you might not know is that in the early days of deep learning, like maybe around 2007, when it was just getting as the start of its resurgence, I guess, a lot of us are around in those early days um, actually had a strong focus on unsupervised learning. And the reason is, um, uh, uh, this is an argument raised by Jeff Hinton. The number of bits of information from unlabeled data is huge. Um, and, uh, and, and maybe in, in comparison to reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, if all you get is a sporadic reward signal, you know, in real life, these rewards are so infrequent and there's so few bits of information, it seems difficult to build an entire system based only on reinforcement learning. To get really technical, I think there is a difference between a cost, a differentiable cost function, which you can differentiate and learn from. Having a cost function is different than having a sporadic point-wise rewards. There's actually a lot more information in a cost function, so I think there is a difference there. But uh, back in maybe 2007, a lot of actually a lot of you know my students' theses back then, and and some of uh, Jan's work, some of Yosha's work, some of Hinton's work was was on unsupervised learning. And then I think what happened was as we scaled up our computers, you know, supervised learning became so valuable, it created so much value for so many people that almost all of us shifted, you know, almost wholesale into supervised learning. And I think we probably maybe shifted a little bit too far. I, I would actually love to, uh, at Baidu, we're investing, other groups are also doing more work in <coughs> unsupervised learning. I think the first wave has been, in my opinion, the first wave of deep, the, the rise of deep learning was because of scale. Bigger computers and more data, and more data is primarily label data. And rather than going from you know image to label, we can now have complex inputs to complex outputs, like 
uh, we were, I think we were the first to do image to sentence, infinite image, I'll put a caption. A lot of people did it about the same time. Uh, 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 you know, there's a sequence to sequence learning, which came out of the team, uh, my old team at Google, uh, and, and, and so on. You know, Facebook is doing like the input a question, I'll put an answer, there's a lot of input to input supervised learning, and we're now seeing richer and richer forms of that. Um, and I think the combination of supervised learning together with lots of data and giant machines to, to, to scale uh, is, in my opinion, what's really driven a lot of the progress in machine learning and deep learning over the last few years. I, am, I, I think there is a point where we're starting to run out of label data. Uh, in speech recognition, you know, we train our algorithms on like a decade of audio, right? Uh, it's about a, a decade is about 9,000, 90,000 hours. And for a lot of problems, just running all the label data. But our ability to access unlabeled data is still nearly unlimited. So I, I, I'm very excited about work there. Um, kind of related to the, what Rich said, one thing I think as people, as, as humans, we have these buckets in our head. There's supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and there's reinforcement learning, right? Well, Maybe, maybe a few other buckets. And we tend to take new things and, and kind of do k-means clustering or something and assign them to one of these buckets. Um, I think there are a lot of algorithms that, you know, we could categorize into these buckets but aren't really. The, the unsupervised learning word embeddings or slow feature analysis, a lot of algorithms that doesn't fit neatly into one of these buckets and I think there's a lot of those ideas. Um, better use of unlabeled data especially, uh, uh, that, that if, if I were a first year PhD student today looking, you know, to do work on the five year time scale, not the two, not the one year time scale, but maybe like a five year time scale, I think doing work on unsupervised Unsupervised learning is something that I would seriously consider, but this was the understanding that unsupervised learning is this vague bucket, it's not one clean idea, it's just this very convenient k-means cluster we're using to, to give an over, overly simplified description of, 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 of a big set of ideas. Maybe Shane wants to come back on reinforcement. So yeah, I'd, uh, we have a little defense of reinforcement learning and, and the, the question that was raised about whether it's appropriate. So I think when thinking about reinforcement learning, it's useful to distinguish reinforcement learning as sort of a framework versus reinforcement learning as, as, as algorithms for, ad for adapting behavior. Um, as an algorithm for adapting behavior, yes, you're getting some sort of sparse reward signal and so on, and that you can only drive so much learning with, with these fairly infrequent um, scalar values. As a framework, um, I, 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 think, I think it's, um, it's, it's very important because what you, want, what you want in many situations is you want agents that act in the world and solve some sort of task or some sort of problem. And that's what reinforcement learning is about as a framework. And within an agent, within that framework, part of the agent's algorithms may be reinforcement learning. Other parts may involve unsupervised learning and, and representation learning in various different ways and, and all sorts of other things. So the, the, the algorithm may only be one part of an agent that employs many learning paradigms, but as a, as a framework, which I, I think this question here is about, I think it's very important because generally we want agents, in many cases, that go out and achieve goals in the world. They have some sort of goal function or something like this. And that's what reinforcement learning as a framework is about, these agents that go out and achieve some tasks. Actually, can I just make my, one little comment of my own and then over, over to Jan. So your comment about the sparsity of the, of the reinforcement, of the reward signal in reinforcement learning. Of course, in a social context, you know, society is rich with reinforcement signals, and the, the, when a human infant, infant is reared, reared, then it's a constantly getting reinforcement uh, uh, reward signals. And, uh, so, so I'm not so sure that, it, that in, a, in a realistic context that, that, that uh, it's quite so sparse, that reward, that reward signal. Uh, anyway, yeah. Well, it's still, you know, one scalar value once in a while, and there is no way this can be enough to uh, train the 10 to the 14 synapses we have uh, in our brain. So, um, you know, that relates to something I said earlier that, uh, uh, which builds on, a, you know, something Jeff Hinton has said for a long time, that uh, to have enough information to constrain a very large uh, neural net to learn the structure about the world, you, you, um, you need to um, essentially use unsupervised learning, whatever, however you define it, which means uh, perhaps predicting the future uh, representing the world so you can do a good job at prediction. To some extent, uh, the essence of intelligence is the ability to predict the future 
and taking into account your own actions into it. And um, uh, uh, so there, there are models, you know, that have been proposed in the in the past uh, uh, based on on prediction. If you can predict what the world is going to look like when you move your head 10 centimeters to the left, uh, you probably have a good idea that the world is three-dimensional. And you weren't born with this. You learned that. You weren't born with the fact that when an object moves, um, uh, you know, it's it's not in the place that it was previously. The objects cannot be in two places at the same time. Uh, you learn spontaneously that when an object is occluded by another, uh, the other one behind it is still there. Uh, you learn that after a few months of life, actually. You're not born with that either. So there's a lot of things you learn about the world by just observing it. And your, uh, you know, babies are, are surprised when you show them things that kind of don't fit with their, uh, their model of the world. And, and you refine your model of the world as, um, as, as you grow. Um, so what methods, what principles, what algorithm, what metrics do we use to build systems that are able to do this, infer that the world is three-dimensional spontaneously, infer that, uh, you know, object permanence, in, in, you know, infer things like this. We don't even have the basic principles for it. And even if we had good algorithms that could work, we don't even have good ways to measure how well they work. For example, um, you try to do uh, video prediction, right? So you have, say, uh, uh, you know, b uh, billiard balls and and you know there are being very simple physics and you can try to train a machine to predict whether balls are going to be a second from now the thing is th there is a lot of uncertainty about uh, how the world works there could be uh, uh, things that happen to the balls you know maybe uh, air current or things like this or you don't have a perfect measurement of, of how the ball are, are being hit hit and, and therefore there is an uncertainty about how the world is going to be a, a second from now and the best, the best uh, uh, a predicting machine can do that you train to, uh, with regression, let's say, with a you know, square error or something like this, is predict an average of all the possible things that can happen, an average of all the possible scenarios in the future. And what you get is a blurry image of, of you know, all the balls at all possible positions. That doesn't work. Um, we, we don't know how to solve that problem. We don't even know how to measure the performance of it if we had a method that, that would do it. Um, 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 we don't know how to represent, uh, another way of saying this as more formal is we don't know how to represent probability distributions in high dimensional continuous spaces. We don't know how to um, build a machine that will tell you, here is a picture that I've taken. Tell me if this is an actual picture or, the, or if this is garbage, some you know, artificial thing or noise or whatever. We cannot, we're not able to build a black box that will turn on a light when you show it uh, a real picture and not turn, on, not turn it on when you, when you show it a, a fake picture, uh, you know, something that is not real or doesn't exist. So that means we don't have good ways of representing the world yet. That's the major conceptual problem we have to solve today. That's what I would recommend, uh, uh, you know, young students, uh, young, young ambitious students uh, starting uh, in this field to try to solve. Yeah, I, I want to uh, make what... Uh, yeah, well, I should um, point out we've only got two minutes left, by the way, so I think we'll give the last, uh, the last a couple of final comments. Is that all right? So uh, let me first defend reinforcement learning to say that the basic perceptual stream that reinforcement learning gets is the next state of the world and the reward signal. And the next state is an incredibly high dimensional object and encompasses everything you've been talking about in unsupervised learning. So this, what is this scalar reward thing? That's nonsense. That's just defining a specific task you're trying to do right now, right? And of course, if you look at any real application problems, it's actually a multi-criterial uh, reward problem. And so there are all kinds of trade-offs, and there's robustness, and there are, all, there are lots of issues there. Um, I, I, so, I mean, I think the, you know, the trouble with calling everything unsupervised learning is that it's just not, it's just like talking about nonlinear, right? It's the residual class, so it includes everything. What's the main challenge we have? It's partly representation, it's partly that, um, the only unsupervised learning methods we have that, w that really work are ones where we do a lot of modeling and impose a strong model structure on the world. Then we can learn without, without a reward signal or, or a supervisory signal. The trouble is we don't, we, we, there's a chicken and egg problem there. We don't want to do all that modeling. Um, and, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe Zubin's automated statistician will be able to, to point the way to, to something like that. No, I'm serious uh, in, in terms of having very flexible non-parametric models that can incrementally impose that. So I would, if I were placing bets, I would be looking at something like that. So Gary, Gary gets the I'd last like, word. I'm pretty, as the last pleased. word, there's a word that didn't come up, I think at all, or at least very much, which is neuroscience. And, and here's my challenge for students to think about, which is why is there so much complexity and diversity in the brain and how does that relate with the simplicity of the models that we have? So there are hundreds of kinds of neurons in the brain, there are hundreds of proteins floating around every individual synapse, half the genome is there to specify the exact circuitry of the brain. 
that doesn't seem to have a reflection in the models that we're building. Is there anything we can get from the brain and why it's so complex that would help us with our models? That's my closing question. Excellent. So all that remains to do is to thank the panelists. So thank you very much indeed. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.